recorded now for everyone who can't make it today. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for coming under slightly strange circumstances. So thanks for taking the risk. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Ronan uh, for inviting me um, and for working with me over the last few years, and John Turner, thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an honour, actually, to be at Bangor uh, School of Ocean Sciences. It's very famous, so I'm really delighted. I'd also like to point out another colleague, um, Kennedy Osuka, is here with me, sitting at the back there. Um, so he's one of the other authors. So um, I'm going to be presenting work that um, these authors have helped me with. Um, and I'm going to start with a few photos to take you out of Bangor and somewhere else. Um, so coral reefs, as um, many of you know, but perhaps not all of you, are one of the most biodiverse systems on the planet. And the Indo-Pacific has the most biodiverse systems of all. The coral reef triangle is extremely well known as the hotspot. Um, but I'd like to also remind you that the Western Indian Ocean is the second biodiversity hotspot of coral reefs in the world. And that's the data I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, fish are a key component of this ecosystem. Um, and they are recognised as that, they're recognised as indicators of um, coral reef, healthy coral reefs, and their biomass is a significant component of those ecosystems. Um, but as I'll point out, they're challenging in lots of ways, trying to get a handle on them in a quantitative manner. Um, people come into this uh, picture very strongly, particularly in our region. 12% um, of the world's population live within 100 kilometres of a coral reef. And of those, that's about 900 million people, and of those, 30% live within 10 kilometres. So it's pretty high numbers, that's about 320 million. And most of these people are in developing countries, and most of the data I'm going to talk to you about are from developing countries in Eastern Africa. And people are highly dependent on reefs for their livelihoods, for their food, um, and this is largely seen in uh, artisanal fisheries, which is, tends to be what we have rather than heavily commercial fisheries. And um, this impact, as you probably know, has a large effect on those fish communities in terms of depleting numbers of fish, in terms of depleting sizes of fish, and that in turn has impacts on the trophic structure of those communities. Um, the other impact that um, I'm sure you've heard lots about and, and obviously know a fair bit about, and I'm not going to go through the, the, the whole process, but um, climate change is having a huge impact on reefs through bleaching. You can see some of those bleaching shots are from uh, Kenya um, here, 2016. And these are, have been severe, severely bleached and other impacts in Comoros. And this is due to the extreme sensitivity of the zooxanthellae algae that live in the surface tissue of hermatypic corals. That's what's very sensitive to, uh, to increasing sea surface temperature. So what we're seeing in the 21st century are major changes in coral reefs. And there's no question that we're seeing transition to, to new coral reef states. Um, and we're, what we're trying to do is get some sort of a, a handle on, on that. Um, so reef fishes, and that's going to be the focus, really, of the talk. Um, they're challenging to measure. They're highly mobile. Uh, in the in Indian Ocean, we have more than 3,000 species. We obviously can't be measuring all of those. Um, and they coexist in these very complex um, environments with a lot of in interactions, uh, external recruitment, self-recruitment. Um, so the, the whole dynamic of that community is complicated. And the work that we've, we've been doing, and that I'm going to present some of it, is really focusing on how to sample these populations and how do we use those results for management it's really a key component of our research. As Ronan said, I work for an NGO. We're very applied, and we're trying to focus our research on that's useful for management and conservation. So oh, it's just another picture of more fish, um, just to give you an idea of the 
the um, diversity. So, as I said, the main objectives um, of the work are to provide management and advice for coral reefs of the Western Indian Ocean um, under the increasing effects of climate change and fishing pressure. So what we first wanted to do was try and understand what are the drivers of the assemblages of reef fishes in this region. Um, and to do that, we needed to separate natural drivers, uh, natural environmental factors from um, anthropogenic drivers such as climate change and fishing. And what we wanted to go from there, and I'm going to touch on that at the end, because that's sort of work in progress, so it's not published, um, is trying to develop aggregate indicators um, that we can use for impact assessments or threat assessments. Um, so just to take you to the region, the Western Indian Ocean um, is here. It's recognised as a, a unique biogeographic province. Um, you probably know Spalding et al.'s marine ecoregions of the world. Um, that's, that's sort of where it's well established. And you can see it's broken into these different ecoregions, um, which I'll come to um, in a little while. Um, fish populations across this region are obviously going to be driven by ocean currents, how isolated those reefs are, the coastal length, the reef extent... And, um, and obviously sea surface temperature limits. So the first thing, um, let's say, the first hypothesis, if you like, which we tested in um, one of the papers, was uh, that fish assemblages will vary naturally in relation to a number of larger-scale abiotic factors, such as geography, uh, reef geomorphology, exposure to ocean waves... Um, depth, and then um, nutrient levels, for which we use chlorophyll A. Um, so we sampled across um, a central part of the Western Indian Ocean reefs that ranged across a wide range of geologies and geomorphologies. Um, and we also sampled reefs that ranged across, uh, ranged across a wide range of nutrient levels, chlorophyll A, um, and also exposure to oceanic waves. So that table there shows you um, a hierarchical description of reefs, and this is based on, um, oh, just to mention then, chlorophyll A and exposure. Um, but that hierarchy has um, very much lent on Serge Andrefoot and colleagues' atlas of reefs in the Western Indian Ocean, which is based on um, satellite data and remote sensing and they've done a lot of ground true things so this is a French team based in Réunion and in France um, so it's a very useful resource and we were basically using that but then ground true thing as well as we went to each of the sites and um, we had those, those are the different um, reef geomorphologies across the data set okay? uh, reef type is listed there, but uh, that didn't come out as significant. So the um, second uh, and third hypotheses were bringing in the anthropogenic effects, so hypothesis two, that fishing pressure and protective management will have negative and positive effects on fish density and biomass, um, and we did that just in the YO data. And then in terms of the climate change, uh, in other words, the impacts on coral and bleaching, we tested that in the Chagos data set um, because Chagos provided us with a, a wonderful sort of benchmark or reference location, if you like, because there's pretty much no fishing and the, uh, it's all one location. So, you know, geography and geomorphology is fairly similar. Um, oh, wrong thing. There we go. Just to um, give you the location, so these are... This is the Western Indian Ocean, and obviously when I talk about Tanzania or Mozambique or Madagascar, I can't be talking about the whole country, you know, particularly Madagascar with huge, huge coastline and reefs extending for a lot of it. So they're locations within each of these countries, OK? Um, but we've got the Comoros in the middle, these oceanic islands. We've got northern Mozambique here, a number of sites in there, and then... Um, southern Tanzania, which that's a blow-up of southern Tanzania, and a few around Mafia, and up into Zanzibar, and then 
the only place we could get to was northeast Madagascar. Okay, so that's the Madagascan site. And then Chagos is here, um, and we had 13 sites there. So it gives you 13 sites here, 45 here, um, and this is the number of fish species in each of those data sets. And when I say site, that's two dives per site to get a full sort of sample. Um, so in terms of human impact, the fishing pressure indices that we used was human population density ad adjacent to the reef site. And then we borrowed a, a threat index from WRI, which is based on fishing pressure um, and a number of things. And we added some local knowledge to that in terms of knowing where sites are um, either dynamited or heavily overfished. And then our protection index, which was... A bit crude, but it was very much based on um, local knowledge. Um, you know, I've worked in the region now this time for about 17 years um, in, in a number of these countries, and then asking local managers about the marine parks there, how well managed are they, etc. Because a lot of that's not published. All right. Um, so we got six six indices there, or six levels in that index. Um, so. Just going to the field methods, the sort of the bulk of the data, if you like, primary data I'm talking about is um, a very standard method of 50 by 5 metre transects. Um, I chose 11 families. They're, there's no big surprises there. They're often counted in visual surveys and um, sampled. The, I mean, if you want details of the methods, uh, it's in the papers, but sampled from 6 centimetres up. Okay, so basically not the juveniles um, of most of those families. And they could be categorised. The main thing about this was they spanned um, a wide range of trophic groups from detritivores up to piscivores. So it was um, a, reasonable, um, a reasonable sample of that hugely complex fish community. You can't possibly count them all. Uh, the benthic folks, so a lot of this data was done by David Abura and Ronan and John did the, um, collected the benthic data in Chagos. Um, so percentage cover, um, rugosity was measured, uh, and then these were, depth obviously, easy to measure that, but I, I just want to mention something here. One of the things I did, which um, quite a few people who count fish tend not to do because of the huge variation. They tend to say, okay, I'm going to just do, you know, 9 to 12 metres or 9 to 15 metres and try and minimise variation because fish communities change with depth. I was more interested in, if you like, a rapid, um, a rapid assessment approach that is actually giving you a sense of that whole fish community on a shallow reef. So my cutoff was scuba, basically, at about 30, 30 25 metres in Chagos, um, 30, 33 metres in the rest. Um, so it is constrained by depth, can't go any deeper than that, but it also means that it's quite variable. But that's what I was interested in, was asking questions around how do these, these reefs here in Tanzania vary from these reefs over here, and you know what have, what have you got there? So we looked at different ways of looking at depth from categorising it from using maximum depth, minimum depth, etc. in, in the modelling. Um, I'm not going to say an awful lot about the data analyses, but just to say we collated 16 abiotic and biotic variables. We looked at species density and biomass, and we then looked at species themselves and species patterns. Um, with a data set like this, with a, the large sort of spatial scale, there's a real problem of spatial autocorrelation. So we ran mantle correlograms to look for that, and what that showed was that space or geography was very strongly autocorrelated, so it was forced into the models. Um, we then looked at patterns using cluster analysis, uh, ran a SIMPA, and then used um, gen uh, distance based linear models for doing the analyses. Um, and as you can see there, it says space and geomorphology actually were forced into the regional model um, because they came out um, very strongly correlated. Okay, so um, turning to the results, in terms of um, bio biogeography, um, spatial patterns in the fish species assemblages, um, I think what this heat map does is give you a nice sort of visual picture 
of what we found over the, the four countries. So I'm now talking about the Western Indian Ocean, not Chagos. And what you can see here is that Comoros in red is very clearly separated and Madagascar is very clearly separated. Um, so this is like a, the cluster analysis, if you like. Um, and then Mozambique and Tanzania are a little bit more muddled up. And so they're conti contiguous on the mainland East African <coughs> coast. So it's not that surprising. Um, and out of 123 species, 37 species were significant in driving this pattern. Okay? And it basically gave us five groups in the cluster. Um, you can see that those groups that had the most diverse uh, species assemblages are in mainland East Africa. They sort of mix between Madagascar, uh, sorry, Mozambique and Tanzania. And then where you can see sort of specific location differences is um, noticeable here, for example, in Madagascar. These are certain um, surgeon fish, Acanthuridae, was seen particularly here and less so in other, um, other parts of the region. And then um, the ubiquitous species that are seen everywhere, so you might think of them as sort of, you know, your classic fish assemblage across the region. Um, I found that quite useful. There's about nine, nine or ten species that, that were in, in that group. <clears throat> um, so then turning to um, a more, more modelling approach to trying to understand these patterns, um, we used a, a cap or nation, so it's a, 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 a forced principal components analysis. And what you can see, it's, it's pulling out um, on two, two principal components. It's pulling out Madagascar on um, the first one, and then com separating Comores from Tanzania and Mozambique. So you're getting, again, those same sort of four country, um, sorry, three, well, four countries, but Tanzania and Mozambique tend to be a bit um, jumbled up together. Um, what this uh, analysis is showing, and you can see it over here, is that the significant variables when you chuck in all those 16 abiotic and biotic variables against, this is density, and the next uh, slide shows a pretty similar thing, and this is biomass. Okay, um, so I'll come to that in a minute. Um, that the significant variables explaining the differences in fish assemblages across this region were space, so that's geography, if you like, the latitude and longitude, um, reef geomorphology, so that was what I was explaining in the beginning, whether it's an ocean-exposed fringing reef or it's an inner-sea patch reef, the ones that are categorised by Andrefoot. Um, those, were, those explain most of the variation, and then chlorophyll A, um, nutrient levels, and then uh, exposure, reef exposure. So the exposure was an index of, um, so it's you know semi-qualitative on site. Where where are you in terms of the prevailing um, monsoon winds? We've got a northeast and a south, northwest southeast monsoon trade winds, and the southeast are the really exposed um, uh, exposed winds. So. That's what we mean by exposure. Um, and then with, with biomass data, um, slope be became more significant. And these are captured up here. So latitude and longitude have to be um, presented as two um, here, but in the model they were forced into one variable to put it in the model. And then everything that's geo was the geomorphology. Okay. Um, Chlorophyll A is there, and then um, I'm just trying to see where slope. So that's slope. So the difference between these, this is the the slope of the reef, how how steep it was, had was correlating with the biomass, whereas with density, it was um, reef exposure. Okay. So together, that's through the distance linear-based modelling. They explain about 40% of the variation in the data. <clears throat> um, so moving to the next hypotheses, which are the anthropogenic um, uh, factors. 
effects of fishing, the, these two analyses did not detect any significant fishing effects at the regional level, uh, which I have to say I was quite surprised about. Um, and we used those three different variables, that human, human population density, the protection index, and the fishing, uh, fishing pressure threat index. Um, and our interpretation on that is that if you do this sort of analysis at that spatial scale, the big differences between the reefs are just obscuring fishing effects. It's not that we think there are no fishing effects. Um, that's um, unlikely. Um, so that's got implications from a um, management perspective. And indeed, when we did ran the same analysis, but just on... Um, Tanzania and Mozambique we did find a fishing effect so it came out as significant in those sort of four key variables um, at six explaining six to six point five percent of the of the variance in the data depending on whether you're using density data or biomass data um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with fish counts the biomass is derived from numbers of fish and size of fish so we're estimating um, fish size in five centimetre size classes. Am I going too fast or is it all right? Yeah? Okay. Um, so having said no fishing effects, um, it's not that we, th we think it's obscured by these other much larger scale factors at that regional level. And so there's a few um, fishing effects stories. Uh, this is one from Comoros. Um, we found that uh, this... Uh, parrotfish, Chlororus sordidus, um, showed some very different patterns when you look at um, the biomass. You can see very high biomass, which suggests um, many more of the bigger ones in Comoros compared to the other locations. Um, and these are the small ones. They're split, split into two because of their trophic function, so it's one of those sort of functional or trophic categorization. Um, so this we would say is probably a fishing effect um, because the Comorians don't tend not to fish parrotfish. Parrotfish are a widely fished group of fishes in, in the Western Indian Ocean, but not everywhere. And in the Comores they tend to fish offshore, deeper hand lining for groupers and slappers and emperors and things like that. Um, and so it looks like there's a sort of bit of a a refuge there in the Comores for, for large, large scarids, large parrotfish. Um, okay. So another thing um, that uh, we... And this is, this is in the paper that we published in Ecology and Evolution. It came out last year. Um, that we wanted to point out with the biomass data... Are you hearing... Is it... If I move away, does it go, the sound go? Okay. Um, there, you see, you'll see quite a lot of um, papers talking about total fish biomass as a good index of, say, fishing pressure, or it's a good management target, or, um, you know, it's a good metric, because I'm going to get on to the metrics and, and, you know, what we should be measuring. Um, and what we put up here was to just show that the biomass estimates um, vary quite substantially depending on where, where, you've, where you've measured them and how you've measured them. Um, and I think a, a, a good example, so the scale here um, gives you, well let's start at the top, so I'm sure you've all heard that um, Chagos is, you know, has exceptional biomass, it's isolated, it's uninhabited except for one atoll and it's been protected from fishing since um, 2010 um, and so you get some amazing um, biomass estimates of over 3,000 kg per hectare and we hear some figures of 7,000 sort of some time back uh, which John would know about and then these um, low levels of around uh, which so they're shown in red you know, 300 or less than 300 kg per hectare is, is considered to be um, worrying and low. And um, I just want to point out a good example from um, northern Mozambique. 
this, so the data that's got no name against it is the data in our data in, in the paper that I've been presenting. And you can see a huge variation in northern Mozambique where there's fishing and there's no protection. So we're not in a marine park or anything. And you can see some sites which are hitting, you know, 1,500 kg per hectare and others that are at the very le much lower levels. Um, and so, you know, some of the sort of, if you like, perhaps gloom that's been uh, spread about, you know, Tanzania or Kenya or wherever, um, I think it, it's really important to know where was it surveyed, how was it surveyed. So the differences between our data and some of the other studies might be that we went deeper um, compared to a lot of UVC surveys. Um, and we were particularly interested in those sort of um, deeper uh, four reefs, if you like. Um, and the other thing, too, is that you've got to be very careful with those totals because there's quite a lot of glib use of, of the word total biomass. Uh, have you included sharks and scombrids? And um, this is an example up here. So Graham's paper has included <coughs> scombrids. Uh, Chabonnet's paper in the French, the <coughs> Ile Pass are the French territories in the Mozambique Channel, so highly protected, uh, usually with nobody living on them, some of them are military bases. Um, so they've got, they're right up in the very high level, but they've got things like sharks in there. So we've got to be very careful with the metrics. Um, okay, so moving on to um, climate change and we used, as I said, live coral cover is our index of that, our measure of that. Um, and there's loads of work that's shown, shown relationships between fish communities and coral mortality, etc. Um, so the fact we didn't get it in the regional study was surprising. And as I say, I think masked by the biogeographic changes, uh, differences across the region. So when we looked at it in Chagos, um, we certainly found strong relationships between um, the fish community and, and the benthic community. So just to remind you, Chagos Archipelago is very, um, well, perhaps not those who just work in Chagos, they say, no, no, it's very different. But, you know, it's relatively similar. It's one location and they're atolls and we're working generally on the fore reef or terrace of those atolls. And um, you can see the um, benthic uh, variables that came out significant. The significant ones were hard coral, uh, rugosity, and dead coral, I think it was, here. And um, then calcareous algae and soft coral were associated with <coughs> other sites on the Great Chagos Bank. And if you plot um, the fish community against that matrix, there's um, significant relationships. And if you then run, and this is the work that Ronan did, so he can probably describe it better than me, um, but if you run a, um, a species ordination, the, the most parsimonious explanation of the differences in the assemblage across the archipelago are these 13 species that explain the differences, which you can see here. So they're associating with that um, slide I just showed you with... Generally, these are the reefs that have got higher coral cover, they're healthier, more rugose, whereas down here on the Great Chagos Bank, there was much more degraded reef, dead coral, etc. Um, and the, some of the most significant species that came out of this were parrotfish and some surgeonfish. Um, and another um, uh, pattern here that I thought was really interesting was that um, parrotfish, which are seen as a very key indicator group on reefs and are used often, you know, the herbivores on the reef, um, we had in completely opposing patterns if you look at the species level. So Scarus niger, Cetoscarus oscillatus, they're scrapers. Um, they associated very closely with um, the, the healthy reefs in these atolls, Salomon and uh, uh, Peros Banos, whereas Pleurora strongylocephalus, which are the excavators, so they feed in a, in a different way, 
um, associated very strongly with the more degraded reefs on Great Chagos Bank. Um, so it's just showing the, the complexity of wanting to come and aggregate indicators when you're monitoring reefs, and then you get these sorts of patterns which make it difficult. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just turn now and, and, and finish off with some of the sort of conservation application of the results um, and talking a little bit about the work that we're trying to do at the moment, which is um, challenging, challenging us a little bit. Um, we need indicators for monitoring coral reefs um, in order to monitor their status, to assess historic changes, to predict future changes, um, and contribute to global variables, if you like, that um, everyone's talking about now in terms of monitoring oceans. Um, and then I'm going to mention a current thing we're doing at the moment. Um, Cordio is doing a red listing of, of the WIO eco coral reef ecosystems for IUCN. Um, so essential biodiversity variables or ocean variables, um, I hope some of you might have heard of those. They're global um, metrics that have been put out by uh, different systems, whether it's UNESCO um, or um, MBON, and then the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, um, which some of you might have heard about uh, for monitoring coral reefs. Um, and we're, we're particularly interested in this. We're, Cordio is a, uh, a focal node for the Western Indian Ocean, collating GCRMN data for monitoring the status of reefs and the reports put out every two years. And you can see that hard coral cover and composition is one of those. Fleshy algae cover is another, and fish abundance and diversity are in there, which is great that they're there, <laughs> but often the reporting never gets to them because of the huge variation in the data and how do you interpret it and what's it telling you. So I guess that's what we're trying to... Um, trying to get at at the moment. So what we did here was we took all that variation I've been talking about, added in uh, a little bit more data. So we'd done some surveys in Djibouti. We thought we'll throw that in. We had some more recent stuff from Comoros. And um, synthesized, if you like, or condensed all that variation, or hope we were going to, and it seems to have done that, into... A PCA and it's come up with two principal components so they're like synthetic variables that explain all those systems that we've just been talking about but we've got now 78 sites rather than so Chagos is in there as well rather than the, the slightly smaller um, sample before and you can see um, principal component one ranges from high hard coral and rugosity so these are the healthy reefs across to rubble and turf algae and then the, the other one is running from exposed that's ocean exposed okay um, so natural exposure to fleshy algae and so what we then did was let's try um, running aggregate fish indicators so not a species but a group of some sort and we picked um, taxonomic groups, we pick families because a lot of the data that's collected, the GCRMN data, is only collected at family level. So it's not very, um, you can't pull apart the species in it. And then the other one that's relatively easy to do, it, well, from, from my data you can do it because it's all species level, is um, trophic, trophic group, okay? Which, where are you? Piscivore, herbivore, etc. Um, so the first thing I want to put up is show you total density and biomass. Um, I was mentioning earlier about the, the pitfalls with using totals for a fish community and that it's nice and simple, but what's it actually telling you? Um, and here you can see this is against the first principal component, so it's going from a uh, degraded reef to healthy reef, roughly. And density is going down, which is a bit surprising, whereas biomass goes up. And then meet, this is mean trophic level within that fish community. What each, each individual, how many of them, at what trophic level are they? Um, so we've got a conflict there already, you know, what's it telling us? 
So we then went to families, because a lot of people are very familiar with families, and they say, oh, I'm going to survey five or ten families. Um, so these are the um, surgeon fish, Acanthuridae, and you can see a, um, a pretty good negative relationship with healthy reef. Um, hard coral on the right, density goes down. If you break this down a bit more, um, Acanthurids are comprised of grazers and grazer detritivores. Is that a, giving you a more um, a tighter fit, a closer relationship? Not really. So there's not much improvement, um, except perhaps the grazer detritivores, which are a small group of, of Acanthurids. Um, moving on to another family that I've mentioned, um, the parrotfish or scarony which are widely used as an indicator. And it was, <laughs> there's no relationship um, with, with hard coral cover, okay, with health of reef, flat line. We thought, well, maybe it's something to do with fishing. Fishing's stuffed up the relationship in some way. So we looked at Chagos, okay, we've got less data there, but it's the same story. So I think what I showed you earlier about, the, depending on what species of, parrotfish you've got in there, you're going to get very different relationships with, um, with healthy coral. It depends on what species and what they like eating, and some of them love those degraded reefs and, and um, associate with those. Uh, so with the other um, principal component, the fleshy algae exposure one, we start to see some, some patterns in there. These are um, just rough, they're not um, modelled, they're just rough, roughly plotted lines, but I think we're seeing um, possibly some, some patterns there. So, um, no conclusions from that, just giving you some, if you like, current work, what we're, we're struggling with a little bit with trying to develop these aggregate indicators. Um, and I'm just going to finish now on the red listing just to mention that the um, just put, yeah um, that the this uh, the regional uh, fish analyses that have been published have been very useful to sort of shore up the choice of eco eco regions within the um, within the Western Indian Ocean. So early data I mentioned earlier um, came from Spalding marine ecoregions of the world and um, that was then built on by um, Obura, who's my co-director at Cordio, um, using hard corals and he defined this as one region so he combined the Mozambique channel sides. Veron uh, later did one in 2015 and split it again I think, John would know, um, and the fish uh, really was, I think, fairly strong on separating the mainland East Africa from Comoros. And then the Madagascans, we did a, a validation workshop on the red listing with everyone from the region, about eight, uh, eight countries. And the Madagascans um, had already done a national level splitting of their reef systems. And in fact, you don't get reefs down here, it's too cold. So it's been helpful to um, confirm, if you like, for us that we do need to work at that eco-regional level. I better get on. Um, so, uh, so in terms of conclusions, um, I think we've demonstrated that um, the large-scale evolutionary factors, um, so geography and geomorphology, um, combined with the present-day ocean currents, um, were really the main drivers of the reef fish assemblages across the four YO countries. And then secondary drivers were suggested in chlorophyll A, so nutrient level, and then the exposure of the reef or the slope of the reef. Um, we didn't see um, fishing effects, and we feel this is because they're simply obscured, and it's, a, um, I think, a strong pointer to say that we really need to be working at more local levels if we want to start looking at that. Um, you could say that perhaps the index of fishing pressure 
um, could be improved, and I think that's true. A lot of us still using human population data. Um, but we did see clear effects of live coral and other benthic um, uh, factors suggesting a bottom-up control of fish assemblages when we looked at Chagos on its own. So we'd, you know, it's like a control site. We'd removed fishing, we'd removed all that geomorphological variation. Um, and a lot of all the species level analyses, I haven't gone into that in great detail, but a lot of the species that were coming out as significant in driving these differences were tended to be lower trophic level data, uh, sorry, trophic level um, taxa, uh, such as detritivores, grazer detritivores, and, and then some of the classic herbivores that you see in the parrotfish. Um, and I think we need, we need to understand those functional roles a bit better, and certainly others are, are working on that at the moment. Um, and in terms of the management relevance, um, I think we, we've confirmed that the eco-regions now, and that's, we're going forward with that for doing a red listing. Um, and the regional targets and setting regional targets for managers, say in MPAs on reefs in the region, we need to be very careful about setting those targets and understand the local conditions and be careful about this sort of magic bullet of 1,000 kg per hectare. Um, and then with the, the aggregate indicators, you know, trying to lump data together, we've got positive and negative relationships. We need to understand those with healthy reef status. Um, so the challenge still remains in um, finding really robust and sensitive and replicable fish indicators to integrate into coral reef assessments. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lisa. Does anybody have any questions? I know. Mm. What's driving that difference then? Is it, is it cultural? Is it access to different technology? Or what's actually driving that? Because it seems quite important for management. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the Comores, are, um, on the whole, uh, well, certainly two of the three islands are, they're volcanic and they're very steep, so they've actually got very little reef. Very narrow reef. Yeah. Very narrow reef. Um, and so it was, you know, that was recognised quite some time ago, and a lot of the development aid that's gone in there since the 80s um, has encouraged fishers to fish offshore and, and go for, well, actually there's a lot of pelagic fishing there. So the, the, even though it's one of the poorest countries in Africa, um, they've actually got better technology for fishing than we have in mainland East Africa. So they've got fiberglass boats and outboard engines and the, the French put fads in in the 80s, so they're fishing around fish aggregating devices um, so there's a, but there's a lot of bottom hand lining, but deep. I mean, they're fishing right down to 100 metres. And we don't see that so much in Madagascar or mainland East Africa. Yeah. Yeah? So what, what would be the ideal way of uh, quantifying fishing? Uh, oh, quantifying pressure? fishing. Um, Okay, um, well, we, I, I might just have a slide on that. Uh, I do. Um, we, I'm working with um, Gwynnon Rowlands at uh, Oxford University, and he's done some um, satellite Im imagery um, measuring of fishing pressure by basically counting boats. Uh, and that's actually published from um, Saudi Arabia. And we're now testing it. So this is actually from East Africa. This is this site in southern Kenya. And these are the fishing boats here. So at the moment, we're um, looking at that to see if, if that's an option. Because I think, um, you know, I mean, I think human population density is a very good metric to look at anyway. It's useful telling us about, you know, human beings and how close they are to that reef system. Um, but if you're particularly interested in, in fishing, then I think you need to get a slightly better handle on that. And our, using that WRI index, we didn't get anything from that, did we, Kennedy? I don't think so. It was just 
the one that the World Resources Institute put out, Reefs at Risk. Um, so we're playing with that at the moment, yeah. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> Laura, do you have a question? Um, yeah, just, just on that one, the distance to market has been that big metric. Yeah. Um, well, I think WRI put that in the in the they they called it a human threat index. Right. So we use that as a an index of fishing pressure. Mm -hmm. So it was in there, yeah. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. I think we might we're we're talking about that at the moment so we've got new data now on the new EU data on human population that's it's much more focused um, but my question is actually about depth depth okay um, yes so I'm, I'm doing a study at the moment looking at how biomass changes across depth and form and um, I was interested in your so you did the fish surveys down to about 33 meters mm. um, and but depth, I think you've mentioned that depth didn't come out as a big predictor, but chlorophyll was a good secondary predictor. Yeah. And yeah. But that's is that that's satellite derived data. Yes. Because presumably then I'm gonna I'm gonna face this issue with my own stuff as well, which is why I'm interested. But this, the chlorophyll A estimates would be from the first sort of two centimeters of the water. Mm. Right. So so it's not going to be estimating chlorophyll A. At no, 20 meters or I don't think so. No. It's interesting that it, that surface level value is a good predictor, just despite the variation in depth. You, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I think the chlorophyll A came out significant because we had um, the uh, southern, north, northern Mozambique, southern Tanzania region in there as. Um, Everything there was high in terms of diversity, in terms of abundance, in terms of biomass. Um, in, on the Tanzanian side, there is a marine park, but it's not been particularly brilliantly managed. There's even been dynamite fishing there. So, and, and the coral people have also, and David's published on that as you know the most, the highest diversity in health and whatever. So we've got a, re a region there that is um, just significantly more healthy reefs than 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 the rest. Um, and that's where the highest chlorophyll A was. So I think in terms of upwellings and productivity and there's more rivers coming in, it's, so that's what, that me that's what the chlorophyll A is telling you about. Yeah. And, and also just to add, I think there's, there's a lot of work that like, um, has been done in the Pacific that says that satellite measured chlorophyll A is a good predictor throughout the water column or throughout the, throughout the surface water column, i.e. you know, 30 metres that we would measure something at. So there's um, Gove, um, a paper in plus one that Gove did, um, and some of the work Gareth has done, and it's all based on the fact that you can use um, surface level uh, satellite drives, surface chlorophyll A as a predictor of chlorophyll A content through the surface but level. Anyways, so I think that's quite well established. I think it's more the, the resolution, you know, you get a, a satellite drive point, you're, you're not getting it. That for multiple points around a small island, you're going to essentially end up with a couple of points and then get an island mean value. And so then, how it's just something that came out, just given that cause. Yeah, so what they were, what they were finding, they, well, you know, about the not going too close to any particular island because then you get all the um, uh, complicating effects of reflectance and so on. But the, that, that relationship only held if you put a buffer around. I think, I mean, the other thing I would just mention on that, it's, you know, it's definitely interesting looking at uh, fish communities with depth. Um, but uh, with the um, geomorphological ones, and Kennedy's doing this as part of his um, PhD, I think it's this one here. Um, Sorry, I'm just having trouble driving. Um, so the ocean-exposed fringing reefs um, tended to have higher abundance, higher biomass, um, which has actually got an interesting management spin on it because when you're working with local communities, we're doing a lot of locally managed marine area um, work 
encouraging communities to manage their own, you know, set up their own little reserves. And they always set them up really close to shore because it's near the village and they can, you know, look watch. after it, watch it. And so the ocean exposed fringing reefs are not being, um, not being covered by that. And we've shown that very um, clearly in northern Mozambique. So that would be an important thing to be thinking about. You know, what reefs have you got? I'm sure you've thought about that with your own work. But, um, and, and then going deeper than scuba is important. Yeah, so we're doing bruv, quite a bit of bruv surveys as well. Baited remote underwater videos. There was a question over there. Oh, yeah. I was just going to come in as an eager looking at the So we've done some stuff on, on coral distribution but, um, in mid latitude. Sees the strap that shaft, so it's a very different location. Just, but we find that the satellite estimates are not particularly reliable at all. Oh dear. If you've got a thermal climb through much of the year, it's going to be the activity on the thermal climb that does it because it's driving fluxes of nutrients. So most of the nutrients don't get anywhere near the surface because you get a subsurface coral for maximum storm. So if even if that's only happening for part of the year, these satellite algorithms, which are based on ad planning algorithms, um, don't detect that. I have Can you sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Um, Okay. Can't remember. <laughs> yeah. It's better than just the surface. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, I can't remember now. Kennedy might remember what we used, and of course, it keeps keeps getting improved, doesn't it? Yes, it does. The chlorophyll. Yeah. And it's super hard to measure in the near surface regions of the ocean. Right. Well, right. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, we just chucked it in because we thought it would be interesting. Let's just put it in there. And I was amazed it came out. It was so significant. Yeah. Mm. One more question and then we'll finish up. Um, I might have missed it, um, but I was just wondering you said there was no uh, effects of fishing yeah. on most of the islands except for when you don't have chain or something. Um, no, no, that's not quite right, actually. We, we looked, when we did the effects of fishing um, testing, that was with the four countries, mm. okay, Madagascar, Comores, and the mainland, and we got no effect at that sort of larger scale. When we got an effect was when we zoomed in on mainland East Africa, Tanzania and, and, and Mozambique. Chagos wasn't in there because there's no fishing, supposedly. So with this group of islands, those four ones that didn't have, that there, were no, there was no significance... Was there much variation in the indices of, that you created? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. That's why we, we were quite surprised, and it's just such a paradigm. Fishing is one of the major factors affecting fish populations. So I, I was actually really surprised that we didn't get it at that scale. Um, and I think that the, the, the differences were larger due to geography and geomorphology. Um, and yeah, no, they were. It's a good. It's a good question. Sorry, just to follow that. Mm. Um, you were looking at it in combination with all of the other factors. Yeah. Right? Does it, if you separate it just fishing, does it are there then effects? Because do the other factors are they outweighing it, and then showing up that they're the significant factors rather than if you just look at fishing without them included in the model mm. that you were using? Does it mm. then actually show that they're mm. the Yeah, we didn't do that. Um, I think what we were trying to do was um, throw all the different variables in and, and look at the relative influences of those different variables. Um, but I, it's an interesting question, that, actually, because you see that sort of work done a lot, and that's where you, you know, we've heard about fishing effects for, for ages now, and maybe that's when you do see it. But, yeah, we could look at that.
Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, you've got to stop the sound. Where is it? <laughs> Recording. Thank you. Oh, pleasure.